So my name's Miss uh, Shanaz Izadi. I'm a consultant ophthalmologist based at Epsom and St. Helier Hospital in Surrey. My specialist area of interest is medical retina and I'm a UK trained specialist and I've been practicing in this area for over 10 years. So diabetic retinopathy is a complication of diabetes. Um, patients who have diabetes are prone to getting um, small changes at the back of the eye initially that need to be monitored very carefully. Um, it really helps if patients have very good and um, optimal control of their diabetes. It helps to limit the risk of developing diabetic retinopathy. So when we see patients with diabetes, we counsel them as to the importance of really optimizing their control of their diabetes and other vascular risk factors like blood pressure and cholesterol cholesterol. And if they smoke, we advise them not to smoke because that can also be a risk factor for developing diabetic eye disease. Um, you're more likely to develop diabetic eye disease if you've been diabetic for a very long period of time. Um, if your control is not so good, if you have uncontrolled blood pressure and cholesterol, if you're pregnant, and unfortunately, if you're from an Afro-Caribbean or Asian background, you're at far higher risk of developing diabetic eye disease. Um, fortunately, in England, we do screen for diabetic eye disease, and it's really important that patients engage with the annual screening program so that um, they can have photographs taken of the back of the eye, the photograph film at the back of the eye, the, where we call the retina, um, so that we can monitor their eye conditions very carefully. So um, over a prolonged period of time, if the blood sugars remain high, um, patients can develop changes in the photograph film or the retina at the back of the eye, particularly in the small um, uh, delicate blood vessels at the back of the eye. And there are three main different stages of diabetic retinopathy. The first stage or stage one or background diabetic retinopathy, as we often call it, is very minor changes in the blood vessels at the back of the eye. So patients get very minor degrees of bleeding at the back and largely patients are not symptomatic at this level and their condition can just be very carefully monitored. The second stage or stage two or pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, patients have slightly more profound or moderate level of changes at the back of the eye. For example, the hemorrhages might be more widespread or visible. And there, be, there may be other markers that the circulation or blood flow at the back of the eye isn't entirely healthy. Again, much like the stage one of diabetic eye disease uh, or diabetic retinopathy, patients aren't very symptomatic. Um, they don't tend to have very many visual problems with the stage two or pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Unfortunately, some patients do progress to the more severe type of diabetic retinopathy or stage three or proliferative diabetic retinopathy, as we often call it. And in this stage, unfortunately, patients grow new vessels at the back of the eye. Um, I tend to call these new vessels mischief makers because they tend to grow in places they shouldn't grow. Uh, they can bleed and they can cause pulling or traction on the retina. And if left untreated, they can cause visual loss. And some patients with this level of diabetic retinopathy uh, will be symptomatic and will have some trouble with their eyesight. And certainly patients with this level of retinopathy are at high risk of losing vision. So those are the three key main stages of diabetic retinopathy. There is another term that patients may come across, this diabetic maculopathy, whereby patients develop leaking vessels in the middle part of the retina. The middle part of the retina we call the macula. So any patient with swelling or leaking in the middle part of the retina, we call it a diabetic maculopathy because it involves the middle part of the retina. And patients, again, are monitored for that condition within the hospital eye services and also as part of the diabetic eye screening program. So in early diabetic retinopathy, our patients largely are asymptomatic. And that's the whole premise behind a screening program so that you check patients and you detect changes early so that you can um, identify them and give like, patients, counsel patients about the importance of making lifestyle changes. Very later on in diabetic retinopathy, patients may develop symptoms along the lines of 
blurred vision, loss of vision, gradual loss of vision, floaters. Very rarely they may get um, loss of um, um, complete loss of vision if left untreated, but that's really very much with later stage diabetic retinopathy. So early on, patients really largely have no symptoms at all. And that's really why it's so important that they engage with the screening program and the screening process, that they attend and participate so that we can detect changes early and give them the appropriate advice. So if um, di diabetic retinopathy reaches the advanced level or severe level of retinopathy, or even um, sight-threatening maculopathy or visually impairing maculopathy and it's left untreated, there is a potential that it could cause loss of vision. And that loss of vision, if left untreated, could be irreversible for our patients. So yet again, it's really important that patients engage with the screening program, um, with attending hospital eye appointments, as if, if that's relevant to them so that we can detect changes early and give them the appropriate lifestyle advice and treat accordingly if it's needed. So diabetic retinopathy, as I mentioned earlier, is a complication of diabetes, and it's really important that we address this with the patient and counsel them as to the importance of optimizing their blood sugar control. And we do that in correlation with our physician counterparts, so the GP or the diabetic um, nurses are really involved in ensuring that the patient has a good understanding of why it's so incredibly important to optimally control their, their diabetes and their blood sugar levels. There are other vascular factors that really influence um, the likelihood of developing diabetic retinopathy, and I touched on those early, earlier. So things like blood pressure control, cholesterol management, it's really important that all the vascular risk factors are um, as best controlled as they can be. Other things that are influential is exercising is important, weight loss if it's relevant to the patient. And if the patient is a smoker, um, they're strongly encouraged to stop. So we have a good discussion about smoking cessation. So we approach the patient very much holistically. We advise them about the lifestyle choices that they're making and how that might influence the risk of developing diabetic retinopathy. And that's probably the most important thing I will do in the clinic with the patient. Unfortunately, even despite this, because of uh, uncontrollable risk factors, that might influence the um, um, likelihood of developing diabetic retinopathy. Some of our patients do um, develop moderate or advanced level diabetic retinopathy or maculopathy that requires treatment. And usually treatment encompasses laser treatment or treatment with injections in the eye or uh, which is usually a course of treatment and very rarely towards the end stage of disease patients may require some surgical input 